Welcome to the Gunnison Spring Ungulate Update for 2020. I am Kevin Blecka, and I'm a terrestrial biologist for Colorado Parks and Wildlife for the Area 16 office in Gunnison, Colorado. About this time of the year, Gunnison area staff provides some kind of outreach event on big game management in the Upper Gunnison Basin. This is the first year we're trying this in a video format, which I hope will be an efficient method for relaying information. So for this particular year, there are six major parts, starting with a little background on the tools and major processes that CPW uses to conserve and manage wildlife, particularly from the wildlife biologist's perspective. A section on elk and deer movement and distribution. Part three will be a status update of the elk and deer populations. A recap of the 2019 hunting season. Part five, a preview of the 2020 hunting season license recommendations. And finally, because parts two through five are mostly deer and elk centric, I'll touch on some other ungulate species. Part one, before, before providing you with the updates on ungulates, I need to go over a few big picture topics. Here are a few basic tenets that one must understand. CPW's mission is to perpetuate the wildlife resource of the state and, in short, provide an enjoyable and sustainable outdoor recreation opportunity that's done in a way that pr promotes the stewardship of Colorado's natural resources. Second is that CPW manages wildlife for the enjoyment and benefit of all Coloradoans and their visitors, and CPW's funding mechanism is user-based. So with these larger big game species that are socioeconomically important and have a big presence on the landscape, what well, we have are herd management plans. And these plans incorporate the public's desires for that population, the habitat capabilities, and other biological considerations into specific management objectives for each Colorado's ungulate herds. And we try to revise these herd management plans on a rotating basis, ideally every 10 years depending on the issues at play. Each herd is defined by a geographical unit called a DAU. A DAU is also just a population. Each DAU consists of at least one, but mostly multiple G game management units, or GMUs. Here in Gunnison, I'm tasked with managing elk herd E5, which consists of GMUs 53, 63, and 54, elk herd E43, elk herd E25, deer herds of D21, D22, and D25. And I'm not going to talk about D20 over in the North Fork as a, another biologist actually manages that. These herd management plans are essential to what is called the management by objective process. The objectives we are concerned with for the Gunnison herds have usually been re, are regarding certain targeted population sizes and sex ratios. The objectives for sex ratio and population size within each plan are drafted by staff and voted for approval by CPW Commission. Every year after that plan is established, we run through an annual cycle of four steps in which we first collect data on the harvest and the population demographics of that herd. Much of this data I'll actually be showing to you later in this video. Next, we examine where the data falls with respect to herd management plan objectives. And then CPW Commission approves hunting regulations with the recommendations from CPW staff. This is where the license numbers for the following hunting seasons are established. And they're done in a way to manipulate that herd to reach or just maintain the objective. So if we were above our buck ratio objective, we might increase harvest on bucks. If we were below our population size objective, we may decrease the targeted harvest on adult females. Finally, we let the hunting seasons be conducted and then start that annual cycle all over again. Now, something important to know is that this process is designed to gather public input efficiently all at once during this stage up here for as long as that herd management plan is active. This cycle is designed to avoid deliberating over license numbers each year for the large number of unique hunts that a hunter can possibly apply for in Colorado. When you put all the unique GMUs and seasons together in Colorado, we are talking thousands of di different hunt codes that a hunter can apply for, which really makes it impossible to consider each hunter's changing desires and little intrinsic things that can happen uh, on an annual basis. It simply is just not efficient. However, CPW staff and the commission receives public input throughout the year as well. 
And finally, another task that most of the public is unaware of that CPW biologists are engaged in is this, uh, we're, we're given the opportunity to review and comment on various land use change policies that might have an influence on wildlife. And this can be a fairly large proportion of CPW biologist time. It's extremely important though, as changes on the landscape can impact wildlife long-term by permanently influencing the land's carrying capacity. Or in other words, carrying capacity is the maximum number of wildlife individuals that can survive out there. Now there are some believe that biologist time should be focused on saving the life of maybe one injured deer, back to that individual approach I talked to you about earlier, or others believe that more focus should be spent creating that perfect trophy hunting opportunity by fine-tuning the license recommendations every single year. Um, however, I just want to remind everyone that these things are very temporary in terms of conserving entire populations of wildlife. There are other more important issues that in the air that have the potential to permanently influence wildlife in the long term for a much greater number of individuals. One of those more permanent issues that we often get to comment on is the uh, uh, placement of new housing developments, which is shown here by the dots between Gunnison and Crested Butte. While these housing locations have a relatively small footprint, each house has this invisible zone of influence radiating out from it, in which wildlife behavior or survival is affected. We also work with public land foresters to help mitigate impacts to wildlife uh, when they're designing their treatment projects. We try to help land managers reduce the impacts from recreation development projects. And we work with energy developers to help mitigate impacts to wildlife as well. And uh, we also get to review livestock allotment applications to help reduce conflicts between livestock and wildlife. And then every once in a while, you have these really big projects that could have influence on wildlife for decades, such as the GMUG National Forest plan revision, which we, as a cooperating agency, have been providing comments on for the last two years. Now CPW is rarely, if ever, making the final call on those land use changes. However, CPW is going to provide information to those decision makers on the, based on the best available science. All too often, we have to take knowledge derived from studies conducted on wildlife elsewhere and apply to local problems. So to fill in knowledge gaps and prove our local understanding, we are conducting more and more studies right here around Gunnison on the movement and distribution of these ungulates. Many of these studies are done by capturing a random representative sample of uh, the, the, the elk population or the deer population. And then we fit that captured sample with radio colors, particularly the units that collect GPS location information. These colors help tell us how, when, where, and why ungulates move. And so far, we've done this for approximately 1,300 ungulate individuals locally. We can do quite a bit with this information, from making heat maps, depicting the locations on winter range that we need to sp pay special attention to and protect from disturbances, to using it to map migration corridors. For instance, this set of black lines here are the movements from a sample of elk representing about 20% of the E43 elk herd or about 1,000 animals. Now in some years, some of these elk are making a 75 mile seasonal migration between the north end of the Gunnison Valley to Sawatch, almost Sawatch, Colorado. And then when doing so, they have to navigate through a set of pinch points on the landscape, which may include things like steep terrain, shown here in the Taylor Canyon. And some of these best crossing pinch points like this one are starting to get choked up more and more with housing developments as well as the increasing traffic volumes on the highways and of course the fences that have been out there for a while. Now there are many other uses for telemetry data but that is actually a several hour presentation in itself so feel free to pause the video and read these. The key thing to know is that telemetry data is starting to become more and more useful for CPW's decision making processes. Moving to part three I'll provide an update on the status of our elk and deer herds. Basically, how are they doing? So a common question we field out of the Gunnison office is, how do we get a count of the deer and elk population size? How do we know how many there are? And the answer is, is that we don't actually count. We estimate with rigorous objective techniques instead. Trying to count everything is actually a fool's errand. 
be, and this is because the count is influenced by detection probability or false negatives. Basically, false negatives are this idea that the animal was actually there, but it did not show itself during that search time that we could possibly allot for that area. Simple correction factors to account for this detection probability don't exist or are at least very unstable. You simply can just go out, count 100 deer, assume you saw 50% of them, and then use that percentage to say that you have 200 deer total. But there are a variety of reasons why a correction factor percentage is going to be changing depending on each situation, and you could pause if you want to read through these. Population size estimation instead is based on logic based calculations using many inputs. Besides helping to estimate the population size, each of these inputs are also informative about ungulate management in itself. There are, they are a major component to this status update that I'm giving you now. So you can read through these, but I'm going to go through each of these uh, right now, or most of these anyway at the moment. The first biological input slash biological update that I'm going to give you are ungulate age ratios. With helicopter surveys, we annually measure the number of elk calves per 100 cows. This ratio indicates how well the calves survived their first six months of life. Unfortunately, we are on average five calves per 100 cows less than we were three to four decades ago, decades ago which is not really good, but it's not as bad as some other parts of Colorado at the moment. And we, of course, do the same thing with our deer herds. This year and last, we are experiencing record-breaking fawn ratios. Now, in line with these higher fawn ratios was the health of these deer. Every December, we capture a sample of six-month-old fawns and fit them with radio collars. We physically weigh each one while doing so. And this December, fawn weights were about 10 pounds heavier than on average. And this was the highest it's ever been since we started measuring it in 2008. Also interesting is that the biggest two fawns that we captured this year, all those dots indicate the max for every year, uh, our biggest two fawns were 115 pounds. For comparison, a 115 pound fawn can look like an adult doe at first glance, or even a second glance or a third glance. Higher than average fawn weights going into the winter often means that we're going to have good survival rates for the rest of the winter. And so that's what I'm going to show you now. And sure enough, deer survival rates, as measured with the radio telemetry collars, indicates that we have well above average survival rates for does this year. Usually we're down around 90% survival at this time. We still have eight months to go. Um, and we are way above average for, for fawn survival this year. Now, one important difference between does and fawns in this graph is that the doe survival is measured across the whole year. And with fawns, we are only measuring survival during the winter period, which is basically the last six months of a fawn's uh, period of its life where it's considered a fawn. Once it reaches uh, June 15th and is alive, it's been recruited into adulthood. And I could actually show you what that recruitment rate looks like. So by combining the helicopter survey fawn ratio data and the fawn collar survival data, uh, we can estimate that percentage of the fawn crop that will survive their first year of life. Once they survive past June 15th, they're considered adults, which is the, our overall goal. For the fawns born last summer in 2019, this yellow dot at the end, I'm pleased to show that we are predicted to have a record-breaking year for recruitment of somewhere between 30 to 35%. This is an indication completely independent from whatever computer-based population model that I'm going to show you later uh, that our local deer herds are indeed growing. And also similar to deer, we monitor the survival of adult cow elk with radio collars. Now adult elk are fairly hardy animals and it takes a pretty good hard winter to cause a noticeable dip in survival, such as what happened here in 2017. And finally, we measure the ratio of males to adult females. Male ratios aren't just used in population models, but we have many of our herd management plans designed around maintaining a set male ratio. That objective is the red line here. The objective in the most recent deer herd management plans for the Gunnison Basin is for a range of 35 to 40 bucks per 100 does. And we are currently about 44 bucks per 100 does. 
Manipulating buck license numbers is usually the easiest way to change this ratio. And we also measure this for elk. And currently our bull ratio is below objective. Uh, but this is primarily because we cannot easily manipulate this with changes to license numbers on bulls as we only control for the number of cows harvested in each and most units. Most of the units we are dealing with in the Gunnison Basin do not have totally limited bull tags. Thus our control over bull ratios is not possible for all the herds out there. Each year after we collected all this data that you just saw in the prior 10 graphs, we compile it and then estimate population size with these integrated population models. Now, how does this work? Well, a computer takes those graphs you just saw of all those parameters that we could collect with different uh, boots on the ground methods and it examines it with the various logic statements. For instance, um, one might be population size must be between A and B if a harvest of X bucks was obtained. If population size is less than A, then buck ratio must be less than X bucks per hundred does, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. You can read through these. These are just an example, though there's others. Uh, the point is that all these biological inputs have to work together. From here, the computer iterates through all possible population sizes and finds the population size that best fits the observed biological inputs without grossly violating the established rules of logic. If time is available, we can do various checks and balances by doing scenarios where one or more of the biological inputs are left out. Now, the level of accuracy with this method of estimating population size depends a bit on the amount and quality of the data we have available. So for a species like deer, we have quite a bit, and uh, elk really aren't that bad, but they could use a little more work. Our pronoir population is small here, so we haven't been able to invest many resources on, the guy, on these guys, and a similar story goes for something like bighorn sheep. Here are the most recent population estimates for the three individual deer herds. We have one herd uh, below the objective range and one herd within the objective range, and one herd above the objective range. Now, these estimates will change for prior years as new data is considered and old data is reviewed. For instance, just in the last month, I found some paper data forms in an old filing cabinet that have allowed me to make some adjustments to this data set, that's this biological set of inputs uh, here that actually has manipulated a little bit the population size estimate going into the past. Um, and really, uh, this is kind of the idea behind these integrated population models, to allow us to incorporate new pieces of information that we learn along the way. And here is a population trend for elk herd E5, in which we are just slightly below objective, but are anticipated to have some growth coming in the near future. E25 is slightly below objective, with growth predicted to occur. And then E43, also with some growth anticipated. The objectives are not shown here as the herd management plan has surpassed its expiration date by quite a bit. Now on to part four, which is a part I normally wouldn't spend much time on, but there was some concerns expressed to us by hunters in the basin on the 2019 fall hunting season. Concerns that I heard might also actually apply, uh, may apply elsewhere in Colorado. So based on the harvest success data we collect, I can see why hunters weren't too happy. Uh, elk harvest in the Gunnison Basin was lower than it has been in prior years, and the deer harvest was lower than it has been in the last nine years. So why is this? Well, there's a few competing explanations for this, and the first is that there are less deer than usual in part due to last year's hard winter. The second is that deer were just hiding better than usual. As for the first explanation, many bear witness to a large amount of deer roadkill around Gunnison due to snows pushing deer up against the highways. However, the population models that uh, I showed you are indicating that the Gunnison deer population grew by about 5% last year. And population models aside, boots on the ground measures of the population's performance uh, that I showed you here in the last uh, slides on fawn ratios, fawn weights, fawn survival, adult survival, and so forth, are also supporting this amount of growth. Remember from earlier in the video, um, I didn't focus on this, but for the 2019 season uh, year, we had a above average, slightly above average adult survival rates, 
and then slightly below average font survival rates. However, this slightly lower than font survival was greatly washed out by higher than average font ratios. So the idea that deer were just hiding better uh, may sound a little silly to some, and I may even sound like I'm slightly offending some hunter's skills out there, and I it even makes me question at times uh, about my own skills. So to test this, I look to the telemetry data that we have collected on approximately 85, 87 mule deer during the rifle hunting seasons. I compare the fall 2019 locations recorded from those callers to the <clears throat> to the same period of time three years earlier, uh, every three years, or sorry, every hunting season during the last three years, 2016 to 2018. So the GPS callers in the fall of 2019, this is in particular the rifle seasons, deer were 26% higher in elevation, 23% further from the road, and in 30% greater forest canopy. All factors that make it more difficult for hunters to locate deer. So why is this? So remember the fawn weights I showed you earlier. If fawn weights are good, the adults are likely the same. When in good body condition, deer are not going to risk coming out of the woodwork during hunting season, or they'll, they'll, they'll risk it less anyway. It's simply not worth the reward in terms of calorie gain. Perhaps they're coming out more during the nighttime hours. Contrary to this idea of deer hiding, it is believed though that snow we had during the second rifle season pushed deer down in elevation and should have made them more vulnerable to hunters. One hunter showed me this Colorado snowpack map for the end of the second season, and it is true that we had snow during the rifle season with the Gunnison Basin measuring approximately 140% of snowpack. However, we probably only have an average of one inch or two of snow depth across that whole Gunnison Basin on most years anyway. So basically, if you take 140% of one to two inches, you're only going to get one and a half to three inches at the most, which is still not enough to push deer down in elevation and make them more vulnerable to hunters. Even the 200 to 300% of average found in other parts of western Colorado isn't probably enough to send deer down in elevation November 1st either. So based on the amount of evidence, I would have to reject this first explanation regarding the idea that there were just simply fewer deer out there and go with the idea that deer were just hiding better than usual. Five, these are the recommendations formulated from local and region CPW staff that the CPW Commission eventually votes to approve on at their May meeting. <clears throat> Starting with elk, in E5, we are proposing to cut 80 either sex tags, 85 bull, and 295 cow tags. Overall, this represents an 18% reduction in tags since last year. Uh, the license reductions are primarily going to be in GMU's 54. Uh, the herd management plan is up to date on this particular herd, uh, in which the direction are, is to grow the herd by approximately 18%. Here is a short justification summary get myself out of the way there. Um, you can pause the video and read it if you're interested. And E43, no changes in licenses are proposed. Again, here is the justification. And in E25, there are no changes proposed to either sex or cow tags, but we are proposing a reduction of 75 bull tags, which is about a 5% reduction to help us bring that bull ratio back up to the objective. And here's justification there. For deer, in D21 we are proposing a 14% increase in buck licenses to help bring that buck ratio down to objective. Here again is justification. And for D22, really no change overall besides a small number of doe tags. And then for D25, we need a more substantial increase in buck tags in D25 to bring that buck ratio down to objective. A small number of doe tags will also be added here. While I don't have a crystal ball, the projected population growth on this population is indicating that we will need to substantially add more doe tags in the future to keep this herd in check for future years. We are really going to hope a hard winter kill situation doesn't come next year or maybe the year after that and spoil a bunch of harvest opportunity. Uh, just as it did for the 2008 hunting season. 
And I'm going to flip through the license history on these uh, six herds here. Um, and again, you could pause the video if you'd like to study these more. And for elk, at least, remember that these are only reflecting limited licenses. We don't control the number of over-the-counter tags. So for E5, E43, E25, then for deer, license history for D21, D22, and D25. Finally, I want to take a minute to talk about the other ungulates. Um, perhaps in the future, gunnus and deer and elk management issues will be less con contentious, and more time will be available to talk about the other two-thirds of the ungulate species we have here. As for pronghorn, this is the first year we have actually uh, a pronghorn population model to work with. We simply do not have a long enough uh, data set in terms of age and sex ratio data um, until now. We just started rigorously monitoring this population in about 2005. So uh, looking at this trend line, I do kind of doubt that we had more than 1,000 pronghorn just five years ago in 2014. But I think the model captures the trend over time fairly well. This population is not doing great at the moment, as you can see at the right end of that graph. Um, and this is most likely due to some strange weather events over the last three years. And uh, this population decrease is not unexpected, given that we probably have the lowest fawn production rates in the state. This population model will not only help us gauge how the population is doing, but it'll help us predict the future buck ratio better and keep it closer to the herd management plan's objective buck ratio uh, tighter. Over the last few years, we have increased the number of buck tags available to help bring this buck ratio down. We've been somewhere around the 60 to 80 buck range uh, when we really need to be closer to 40 bucks per hundred, our objective at that red dotted line. So for this season, uh, we appear to be there, uh, but to maintain this, we got to actually cut some buck, ta buck tags. And one other uh, thing I should mention is that we also have a new herd management plan in the works for the Gunnison and Pronghorn population. For moose, we don't have a lot of data, but the population appears to be increasing. We are seeing more and more of these moose in novel areas where, when we are conducting our helicopter surveys for other ungulates. And this is indicating that these moose are colonizing new areas. The population is thus growing. And hopefully they'll stay out of weird areas like this. Um, and thus, with the population growth, we're proposing a small increase of only four bull tags in various places throughout the basin. Most of the herds for bighorn sheep and mountain goat, uh, at least on the last few years, are steady or at least unknown. Um, but we have some increase, some herds increasing, like S69, and others decreasing at the moment, S52 and S80, which aren't even hunted populations. And then we have uh, herds like G8, mountain goat population, false ridge that we don't really know much about. As for bighorn sheep and mountain goats, the license quotas are already established, and they can be found in the CPW sheep and goat brochure on our website. With that, I will conclude this video. Thank you for sticking out to the end. And if you would like any detailed information on the proposed license quotas for any particular hunt code, reach out to us at the email below. Any feedback, comments, or questions that you might have uh, can also be directed to this email address. With that, I hope to see you next year. Thank you.